to hear me speak. Let me just get an idea. One person, two, three, four. Okay, wow, so catch up. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, so I told my story. I told a lot of my story on Sunday uh, morning about the highs and the amazing things that God did and how he's taken us to live with the homeless and the miracles that we saw. And, um, and so for those of you who don't know us, we have um, 13 children that we raise and seven are biologically ours, two are adopted and the rest are um, Hanai, where we take them in, we don't get anything for them, no, no help with finances, just that we live life with parents and we, we, um, we partner with the parents to make sure the kids have stability and education and just love, love. And, and a lot of those children have had a love encounter with Jesus, which is most important. <laughs> so that's our family, and uh, we come from Hawaii. And uh, so I, I heard that some of you were wanting to go to Hawaii and weren't able to get there, so God loved you so much that he brought Hawaii to you. <laughs> that's beautiful. That's that's tells you how special you are. I thought God, I was one of God's favorites because we wanted to see snow and everybody said, that's impossible, it's summertime. It was like, and yet, when we were in Arizona, <laughs> there was a mountain with snow on it and my kids got to play with snow and I was like, did you know that I'm one of God's favorites? Because <laughs> the people there, the locals were like, they were saying, we didn't know what was going on. It's like, our, our, our winter came really late this year. I was like, God, you held back the winter for us? <laughs> I felt very special. They didn't like that very much. You know? <laughs> they just said it was a miserable winter. It's like, oh, we got to play in snow. <laughs> so anyway, that was pretty neat. Um, anyway, so then uh, on Sunday evening, I shared with you the hardships, and I, I talked about one of the hardest seasons of my life, the people who died and that we love, the car wrecks, the, our animals dying, and injuries and, and all kinds of things that just weren't healed. We didn't see us, there was a year and a half where there were no miracles. You didn't see miracles, you didn't see healings or anything. So you went from this amazing mountaintop and then I talked about how I went through a sexual assault in that season and, um, and that, made, that sent me to the lowest of valleys. <laughs> And, um, and I talked about the healing that came from that and where God helped me to finally forgive, forgive myself, forgive God if that I felt like God let me down. I had to forgive the man who hurt me and all the other men who had hurt me in my life, you know, from the time I was a kid till then. And, um, and releasing judgments I made against all men. You know, you can kind of categorize everybody. It's like, all men are like this. Or, you know, it's like, you can have a bitterness, uh, some hurt from your parents, and then you can just say, my, my, my father never did anything right. You can categorize things like that and make these judgments that are wrong. And sometimes we need to repent of the judgments we make. And then I mentioned that the last part of my healing was really when I learned about generational curses. And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight, is breaking generational curses, the biblical way. And so let's start with prayer. I'm gonna ask God to just come and teach us. So Father God, would you just come? Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. Would you come and would you fill this place? And would you radically begin to pour out wisdom and understanding and the knowledge that comes from you. May every word that comes out of my mouth, even if I'm speaking in a way that maybe isn't making sense, that you're gonna make it make sense in the heart of each and every one of us. If my vocabulary is too large or too small, Father, that you're, or even just a pigeon, <laughs> if I talk and I say a word that they don't understand, make it make sense. And God, again, just remove any obstacle, anything that would try to hinder your spirit from being here in this place. Oh God, rain down here right now. And that you would help us to open our hearts. Whoever has walls that are built up so high and maybe a heart that's been wounded and so hard, would you cause that hard heart to begin to melt and soften? And God, in every wall that has been built may it come crumbling down right now. And may our hearts be open right now to receive your word. May our ears be open. Anything that would try to plug our hearing. God, that you would pull out anything that was, is plugging up our ears. So we can hear clearly what, what the spirit has to say. 
And God, would you open our eyes? Would you pull the scales off of our eyes so we can see where you are, that we might join you, that we might see truth for what it is? And God, would you just touch our minds, that we would have the mind of Christ and that things, again, are going to make sense, that we're going to have that wisdom. So, so Father, you just take charge. Would you just take over even in my life, Father, that you would lead this service, and I would just go wherever you're going. So have your way, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Ooh, don't you love that? <laughs> it's so tangible. And for those of you who weren't here on Sunday, I don't have a disability. <laughs> my hand shakes, or my body shakes, I should say. The stronger the presence God get, get, comes on me, my body just can't seem to take it. And, um, and so um, I wind up, my body just winds up shaking. And it doesn't hurt, and it's OK. And uh, when it subsides, it just stops. <laughs> so I just want to let you know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sick. I don't have a disability. It's OK. I am going to pass out these um, pamphlets um, to hopefully like per family. So if my kids are passing it out, and how many come? You come? Maybe one per family, because um, I don't think we have a whole lot. Let's see. We have a few more up here if we need to. Hmm? 19. Yeah. So I'll wait. I'll wait till you get that. This is something that my cousin and I put together after uh, after we learned uh, about, and, and there was such a transformation in my life after I went through this that I I had to put it down. You know, I had to do a lot of research and studying and, and make sure that it was uh, put down. Anybody who doesn't have one yet? Raise your hand if you don't have one yet. All the way in the back. Yeah. Okay, and if, if you can, try to share for those um, who are close by each other, that would be helpful. Okay, I'm going to tell you my story. Okay, so after the sexual assault, again, I said I was healed, you know, I'd forgiven, I'd released judgments, I had finally had this, uh, like, where I was allowing the presence of God to, um, to downpour on my life again. And, um, and so it was beautiful, as far as um, my relationship with God, it was beautiful again. But there was just this one thing that really bothered me. And what I wasn't prepared for, and I'm going to be very honest with you because I don't know how not to be. You know, it's like I'm very open and very vulnerable. But um, I just believe in living that way. I don't believe in hiding things. I don't believe in, in keeping secrets. But this is what happened. After the, um, the sexual assault, I was out cold, right? I had a seizure. So I was unconscious when it happened. Um, but I, I woke up and I, I knew something had happened because of the condition that I was in. And, um, and the person that did that to me never lied about it. But, you know, as I, like I said, I didn't know how it happened. I just had no recollection. But the crazy part is that two months later, my brain reconnected to my memory. And all of a sudden, I remember everything that happened. And I asked the neurologist, I said, how is that possible? How could I... You know, I was unconscious, I didn't remember anything, and now I'm getting these vivid, vivid memories. And he said, well, that's normal. Your brain is actually recording while you're having seizures. You could actually have memories re come back six months later or a year later. And I'm just thinking, that's, that's crazy, no. <laughs> but, um, and sure enough, it was all, all really, you know, accurate memories. Um, but from that day on, I couldn't shut the video off. Let's just say, the memory replayed over and over and over. I felt connected to this person that I never wanted to be with. You know, it's like my body is like pulling me to go and be with somebody I never wanted to be with. I feel like, and I, and I feel for people who have had this happen and they don't know why they feel so connected when they absolutely hated the event that happened, right? But that's what happened to me. And so I'm getting, all, I'm getting this pull towards this person, and I'm getting this video that replays and replays and replays. And so I said, God, 
break this soul tie because I've been taught about when you you know when the two become one you know it's like it's like there's a soul tie that connects even if it's not wanted you know even if it was forced on you it still happened and so I asked God break every soul tie nothing happened I still get the, the video playing when I'm going to school I'm in school and the video is playing I'm teaching and it's playing. I'm trying to wash dishes and it's playing. I'm driving and it's playing. Every time I wasn't busy, every time my mind wasn't mentally busy, this video would play and it would bother me because I didn't want to be connected to this person. I didn't want to remember what happened. And so I said, God, shut this video off. This is months and months and months, like, or like over a year. This video is playing in my head and I'm saying, God, shut this video off. I don't want to feel this. I don't want to remember this. You know, it's like you said you came to make me whole. You, you healed and, that, and you said you came to save. And the word is sozo. And the sozo means to save, deliver, make whole. Well, if I feel still broken because I feel connected to this person, I don't feel like... I've, I've experienced what he said we could have. So finally, I've done everything I knew to do. I did everything that every pastor had ever told me that needed to be done if you've ever been through something like this. I did everything that I ever taught anybody else to do <laughs> that, that had been through something that I had been through. And nothing worked. Nothing would disconnect this. So finally, I said, God, I don't know. I don't know what else to do. I'm just, I just know that you know what to do. So I'm gonna just let go. And I'm gonna just let you show me what needs to be done. And um, so I stopped trying to figure it out. Then a couple of days later, my cousin says, hey, I'm gonna preach a message on generational curses. I said, well, I've heard a lot about generational curses. I said, but I haven't found anything to be effective. I said, I'd be very curious what you have to teach on. And so he tells this story to me. He says, there was this man, he had a job. And every job that he had, he was treated really bad. He was always treated like the black sheep in his job, like a slave. He said, I don't know why. I don't know why they hate me so much. He says, I'm kind. I always show up on time. I'm hardworking. He said, I'm a pleasant person. I'm an easygoing guy. He said, but every job I get, they treat me so bad. My bosses treat me like a slave. And so when they took it to God, they asked God, you know, what's going on? Like, why is this always happening? And, um, and so God revealed to them that this man had, in his generations before him, so his ancestors before him, they were slave trade owners. And they were very harsh with their slaves. And so God said, would you just ask me to forgive the things that they've done, and this curse will be broken off of you. And so he asked God to forgive the sins that his ancestors committed against people by, by being very harsh to those slaves. And it broke off of him. And after that, from that day on, every job he had, he was never treated that way. It's like he started being prosperous. His, his, um, his home and everything else was prosperous. Okay, so here I am. I'm listening to the story. All of a sudden, God begins to speak to me. I'm in a car, and he's talking to me. He said, he starts talking to me about these scriptures, like in Leviticus, it says, if you'll repent of your sins and the sins of your fathers, then I will remember the covenant I made with Abraham, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, basically, I will remember the land. I'll restore you. If you read that passage, it's talking about that. And then I remember there was these times where, where the Israelites would get together and they say, God, forgive our sins and the sins of our fathers. Right? And I'm thinking, why haven't I ever thought of this? And then I remember that in the second commandment, it says that I will follow the sins of those who hate me to the third and the fourth generation. Okay, so, right? So this is where the generation of curse comes on. So it follows from generation to generation. So then he basically starts talking to me about my Japanese heritage. And um, I don't know if you've ever studied about the Japanese, but most people think, you know, it's like, oh, arigato, oh, so sweet, oh, so nice, you know, because <laughs> like real humble, real quiet, <laughs> and uh, not true, <laughs> not true. They were very brutal. 
absolutely brutal. If you'll study how they were when they went to war, I mean, they slaughtered. Um, and uh, so they would go to war and they were told, kill everybody. If you look at the rape of Nanking and, and the things that they did to the people, I mean, 300,000 people, like, just slaughtered everybody. They were defenseless, they were not in the military, they slaughtered civilians, no problem. They would grab the babies out of the mother's arms, throw them up in the air bayonet them. They would slice the pregnant women's stomachs open. They would rape anybody from 8 years old to 99 year, years old just because they could. And then they killed them right after that. Or they would take the 13 and 14 year olds and they put them into pleasure houses where um, they would line, them, line up all the soldiers and they could do whatever they wanted to those girls. And you think that it's pleasant, but no, I mean like not pleasant, but, but that, that, um, that it was just you know a normal like, oh, just do your thing. But no, it was very brutal because these men were trained to never show emotions. Samurai, you don't cry. You don't show any sorrow. When you kill, you better not flinch. If you flinch, you are, you're weak. You might as well commit suicide. You do not talk about it. You do not express your emotions or anything like that when it comes to that, so you need to be tough. And so when you have a man that isn't allowed to cry, you begin to create a violent, violent man, and he is not okay. Is not okay. <laughs> so these girls were being choked and being tormented and tortured, and uh, and like I said, they were often killed. You know, they and the uh, majority of them were killed. Hundreds of thousands of girls were killed. And so then they go home, and it is not unusual for a man or father to be sexually abusing his daughter or a family member to be sexually abusing their family member. And I don't know if you know this, but it is not illegal in Japan. Uh, like there is no crime when it comes to incest. And there's really very, very few people that will ever go to jail for a rape because it's just not in their laws. So pretty much, it's really, really difficult. So a lot of these girls stay silent. You are not allowed to speak about it. You never talk about it. I know this firsthand because in our family, for four generations, I witnessed that. That's exactly what it looked like. For four generations, we saw this repeat and repeat and repeat. And I guarantee you that there's some of you in this room that understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> that sexual abuse is something that has repeated in your generation, from generation to generation. And it's something that the churches a lot of times don't want to talk about, but we need to talk about because people are stuck in this prison and it keeps happening over and over and over because we don't deal with it. Anyway, so for four generations, we saw every girl, except for one that I don't know for sure, that was sexually abused by a family member. And I, and I don't know about that one, but I'm, I'm pretty sure, if I were to ask, that probably was true. Okay? So, we see this repetition. And then, you know, so here I am, I'm, I'm listening, and God starts talking to me about these things that are followed from generation. He said, Abby, he said, nobody asked me to forgive the sins that your generations have committed. They were so violent, they were so brutal, they murdered. And then they, they raped and they did incest and all these things that keep following in our, in our generation so much harshness, so much, you know, in, the, in that, you know, keep secrets, even though they're harmful to people. Don't tell, you know. And so he said, nobody asked me, he said, would you just stand in the gap? Would you just ask me to forgive those sins that were committed? And so I remember saying, oh man, I gotta get alone with God because something is just about to burst inside me. And my cousin says, why don't you just do it right here, right now? I'm in the car, right? And so I just burst out crying. And I just, um, I started talking to God and I was like, God, forgive the sins of the generations before me. God, forgive my ancestors. God, forgive them for the rapes that they committed. God, forgive them for the brutality. God, forgive them for the murders. God, forgive them for the violence. God, forgive them for the unforgiveness. God, forgive them for all the sexual immorality. God, forgive them for the affairs that they committed. And God, forgive them for the divorces. God, forgive them for the suicides. God, forgive them for worshiping other gods before you. God, forgive them for the sacrifices that they made that were unpleasing to you. God, forgive them for the disobedience and the rebellion against you, God, and against Against their parents. God forgive them for the lies and the cheating and the complaining and the gossiping and the critical spirit. And God forgive them for the suicide of the samurai spirit where they held all their emotions and they thought they had to be tough and they had to be rough and they couldn't be loving. God forgive them for physically abusing their children and their family and others. And I just kind of just 
started to just tell them all the things that were in my heart that were just bursting out, the things I understood that they had committed. You know, as I, you know, I was saying, God, I'm not going to take part of these things. And it was so crazy because something in my chest, it's like it just broke. Like, almost like a bottle of oil in my chest. I couldn't even explain it. Something just leaked through my whole body. And I felt very different. I mean, I was crying, but something didn't, something was different in me. I have experienced the presence of God where I shook and things like that, but there was something different about this presence that went through me. And I thought, that was it. I thought, wow, something happened. But I go to sleep that night. I go to church the next day. I'm supposed to practice uh, for worship that, uh, for that Sunday. I can't even get up to practice. I have to run outside to where the grass area is, and I start throwing up this, I start coughing, and I throw up this um, phlegm, like mucus. <laughs> Just mucus. I ate that day, but I threw up this mucus. And I'm thinking, am I not feeling good? <laughs> it's like, I thought I was feeling fine, and am I not feeling good? But I go to Sunday school, and I have to run out again. I run to the bathroom. And this time I, I throw up another three or four times. Again, it was just mucus. And I'm thinking, God, that's spiritual deliverance. What's going on? And, um, and he said, Abby, those things, those things that have been in you, they don't have the right to be there anymore. He said, you know, and um, I remember the scripture that says a curse cannot come without a cause. I dealt with cause, it had to leave. <laughs> okay, so so there's that. The day number two after I had done this prayer, for the first time I realized, one, my shoulder was the one that was injured, yeah. Um, that was kept popping in and out, popping in and out because of it being dislocated, which is what caused the seizures. All of a sudden my shoulder wasn't popping in and out every like like you're just it just had nothing holding it in. <laughs> And all of a sudden, it was more solid. And then um, I realized, for the first time in over a year, I had a silent brain. I had no reoccurring memories. The video had stopped playing. I hadn't even realized. Here's the cooler part. I know this sounds really personal, but I, I don't care. <laughs> From the time I was a little girl, very little. As far back as I can remember. I was maybe five that I can remember. I'd have these sexual fantasies that would play in my head. Like romance movies in my head as a little girl. And it would start off as romantic and then it would turn into something very sexual. And I thought as I grew older and I became a teenager, I mean I'm not kidding, it's every day. Multiple times in the day this videos were playing in my head. And I thought that was normal. I thought every Christian Satan tries to put bad thoughts in their head. And that you as a Christian have to just choose to say, I'm not gonna look at that. I thought I used to tell guys, I said, Yeah, you guys have it easy. You guys like struggle with pornography. <laughs> I said, You guys have to actually choose to go there and turn on a computer. I said, Women struggle with fantasy. I said, it's in our mind. It's like we have to choose to look away from it. You know, it's like it's everywhere we go. <laughs> there is no computer to turn on, it's there. I thought that was every girl. I thought every girl had that. <laughs> Find out it's not true. <laughs> but I do meet a lot that do have this same problem. And um, anyway, so here it is, I'm having these videos that play from the time I was itty bitty to the time I'm, you know, here I am as a, a 37 year old going through this and, um, and I'm thinking, you know, I thought that was normal, I thought everybody just says no. Say, can you try to put those thoughts in my head? No. But it's like a strong pull to always look at this video and, uh, and be a part of it. And on that second day, after saying the prayer, not only did my mind go silent from the reoccurring memories, but my brain was silent. It had no videos playing. That was the first time in my life that I could ever remember not having that. I thought that was normal to have those kinds of things. I found out that is not normal, and that was coming from something else. Probably because of all the sexual abuse that we're talking about, and the sexual violence in my generations, that it was like over me, almost like a victim spirit that was over me, right? That just continued to have that happen. And um, anyway, 
I will tell you this, and I don't normally tell this part of the story, but I feel like it's important because this is really the truth of what happened. <laughs> when I would pray, and I told you guys those eight weeks of prayer, right? And my body would be shaking under the presence of God, just like, whoa! <laughs> it was like, wow! And I'd be on my bedside, you know, it's like from that time on. And I'd be on my bedside and I would pray and pray, like that God's presence would come and my body would shake and things like that. And this is the truth. Every now and then, not all the time, but every now and then, in the middle of all of that, you would hear this, <sighs> and I was like, whoa, what was that? Like, where'd that, gro where'd that growl? Like a tiger, like you're just, and, and it's like the stark presence would surface. And I was just like, God, I don't know any sin that I need to repent of. I don't know what I would allow something like that to be in me. I am like, experience you in the fullness. <laughs> How could something still be there? But he, he never explained, and I realized now I wasn't ready because I wouldn't have understood this generational thing at the time. But every so often, every few months, this thing would show up even in the middle of prayer. So five days after saying this prayer, I'm sleeping, I wake up to this, <laughs> you know, that like you're just like wake up and it was just like making this loud roar and a hissing sound in fact. And I was just like, <sighs> What is that? And I was so tired that day, I fell back asleep. And I woke up a second time, and everything was pulling inside of me. And again, I and it was, it kept on doing that. And, and my husband walked in right, in right at that moment. And he saw it. And so he came over there on the bed, and he started commanding that thing to get off of me and to leave. So after about, again, God kept telling me, he said, it has no right to stay. The spirit of wrath has no right to stay. Now, if you knew how brutal the Japanese people were, and if there was that spirit of wrath in me that was passed on from generation to generation, which I could be the nicest person, and then you could see this thing that would come out of me every so often, just like, whoa, that's not even me. <laughs> but yeah, so after about 20 minutes of him praying, that thing left, I had never ever seen it again. Never heard it again. It was like, at that moment, from that day on, that was the last of it. And it was like I was a new person. That was when I felt like the rape had never occurred. I was so healed. I was so solid. I did not feel like a broken person anymore. There were no tears that were going to be coming. It was just like I was solid. I was like, wow, this is what you meant when you said you came to make us whole. I feel like nothing, you know, it's like it just feels like you're just so strong on the inside out. Now you get these temptations, like these weird thoughts of, of doing wrong things, and it's like, it's so far away. It's like, nah. <laughs> Before you get these things on the inside pulling you to go there. And now it's like from the outside, but it's, it's like, it's not even, not even looking good, <laughs> not even tempting. Like it's like it's so far out. I was like, there's a difference. Now there's a generational thing. I think it's just like it says the iniquities, and this is an internal thing. And now it's gone and it's broken. And now they only can tempt you from the outside. And it just I don't know, just doesn't seem so tempting. Anyway, so that was my story. And so I had to dive into these scriptures, and I'm going to go into this. And you've got a pamphlet in front of you. I want you to flip. Over to the next page. Why do generational curses come upon us? Let me see. This is page two. The scripture in Exodus 34, verse 7, and I kind of highlighted it, but I want you to see it in scriptures. I want you to do your own research. I want you to dive into it yourself. So this pamphlet is here for you to study. It's not just for you to take my word on it. Now, I know it to be true because I lived it and where I am today because I'm months and months later and I'm still solid. <laughs> this is like a year later, I'm still solid. <laughs> so I was like, this is not a wavering thing. It's like, I know this is true. Exodus 34, 7, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and patient, and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands. He forgives iniquity and transgression and, uh, and sin by no means clearing the guilty. So pay attention to that. 
By no means is he going to clear the guilty. So if your ancestors have sinned, by no means is he going to clear the guilty. If you sin, by no means does he clear the guilty. He's a just God. There are judges that, you know, they may not be able to put that murderer in prison because they don't have enough evidence. There is no way you escape the spiritual police. God sees everything. There's no way you can pretend the evidence is there. And then because he's a just God, that means he always does what is right. If there is sin, there must be payment for that sin. Now we have this ability to let Jesus be that payment, but really there's a that sin must be paid for. The wages of sin is death, right? So by no means is he going to clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity or the sins, and it's usually what's put on the inside, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Okay, you see it, right? That's where the curse is, to the third and fourth generation. Exodus 25 through 6 says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation to those who hate me. This is actually the second commandment. The second commandment is where you put other things before God. Right? Worshiping other things before God. This is the this is part of that second commandment. But showing love to thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So you can have a blessing and cursing. It seems like it's, it can be at the same time. So as you've got one parent that loves God and you've got one parent, because that's actually kind of what I saw in our, our family. There are these blessings that follow, but there are these other things that are following. Matthew 18, 21 through 35, this is the story where... Um, uh, there was a man who owed the king like a million dollars. That's really what the debt was, was something like a million dollars. And the king brings him to his court, and he says, pay back what you owe me. And the guy says, I don't have it. I, don't have, I can't pay you back. And so the king says, take that man's wife and his children and throw him into prison uh, until he can pay it off. Right? Command that he be sold with his wife, and his children. So I want you to pay attention to that because your sin and your parents' sin, it doesn't just affect you, it affects you and your family. So it's like, it's not just a one person thing. So we want to pay attention to the things that we're doing because if we think, oh, it's just me that has to pay the penalty, really, does divorce only affect you? Or does it hurt your children? Does it hurt your spouse? Sleeping around, does that just affect you? Saying mean things, does it just affect you? <laughs> right? I mean, punching somebody in the face, does that just affect you? <laughs> no. We know that sin doesn't just affect us. Our sins affect other people. And you can read all those other scriptures in um, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Proverbs. So what curses can come upon us? We are going to go on the bottom of page two. Now, if you see it in black, it's word for word scripture. If you see it in red, I tried to make it make sense in today's term, what it would look like in today's term. If this curse was on you, this is what it would might it might look like this. And if it's in blue, it's because it was so long, it went on and on and on. And I didn't want to print out 20 pages. So I kind of paraphrased it. Okay, but you can study it yourself. But let's go over some of these. In verse 15, it says, These are the curses for disobedience. Why? However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees that I'm giving you today, all these curses can come upon you and overtake you. So you not, you're hearing God, but you're disobeying him. You're not willing to obey him. 17. So one of the curses, I want you to think about, have you seen this in your family? Have you seen this repeatedly happening in your family? Number one, 17 says, your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. So that, in today's term, that would mean that you would struggle to have enough food. Number 18, the fruit of your womb will be cursed, and the crops of your land, and the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks. So you might see miscarriages. You might not be able to get pregnant. When they talk about the, the crops, the calves, and herds, that was actually your finances. That was your provision. That's what actually, like, if you had a lot of calves, herds, you were wealthy. Right? If you had little, you were poor. So what it's talking about is your finances. So today's terms, it might represent yeah. that uh, your finances will be cursed, that you're not, you're not able to have a lot of provision in that area. Number 19, it says you will be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. 
everywhere you go. You can try and run from one place to the next place, but you're still having this curse follow you. Go from, um, go from the US to Australia, go from here to Japan, wherever you go, you're cursed when you go in and you're cursed when you go out, no matter where you try to run, this curse follows you, not the land, you. <laughs> 20, this is paraphrased, this is confusion and everything you try to do keeps falling apart. So it might look like this. It might be you losing your job after job. Losing, a, You might be losing job after job. Unhappy in your job. You might be unhappy in school or struggling in school. Your cars keep getting destroyed in accidents. Everything you work hard to build, for some reason, it keeps falling apart. Maybe you keep trying to save money, but you keep losing it all. And number 21 it says, the Lord will plague you with pestilence, and a pestilence will cling to you. So that would be like insects that are hard to get rid of, like lice, bed bugs, roaches. I don't know what kind of insects you might have here. Uh, 22, wasting diseases, fevers, inflammation. So things like heart problems, strokes, rashes, gout, scorching heat and drought, blight, or fungus, and mildew. <coughs> 23 and 24 says the sky will be like bronze, so there will be no rain. And the earth will be like iron, so plants cannot grow. So, and then it talks about dust from the heavens. Uh, that basically overtakes the land. So things like sandstorms. Uh, so just think of the Middle East. There's a place where there used to be a lake, a famous lake called Ermia. It used to be a really huge lake, and now it's shrunk by nearly 90% since 1970. Iran has been suffering from harsh sandstorms on top of that. So my night, where I come from, what used to be called the Poi Bowl, you know, back, in my, <laughs> back in the day, uh, it was called the Poi Bowl. And uh, so it was very fertile, extremely fertile. There was a lot of taro that would grow there. Like, so, um, and it was, it was swamp plants. So there's lots of water everywhere. Today, it is one of the driest places of the island. It's like, it's super dry compared to like the rest of the island. And yet there's this heiau, right where our church is, there's this road and they, they um, it goes right up to this heiau where they did sacrifices there. And uh, so I, I definitely see a correlation in that. Okay, so 25, you will be put to shame in front of those who are your enemies. 26, your carcasses shall be food for all the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth and no one shall frighten them away. So the curse that could follow is that nobody, no one is even gonna care about you. Nobody's gonna care when you're dead. It's like, they're gonna be like, almost kinda like, yeah. Good. <laughs> 27, here's some curses that can come on, and I'm sure you've seen these. Boils, tumors, and cancers, festering sores, and itch. So STDs, ulcers, rashes, allergies, and it says from which cannot be cured. 28 says insanities. Have you known anybody that lost their mind? Have you known anybody that had paranoia, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, amnesia, blindness, confusion of the mind? 29, it says, you can't seem to figure out where you're going and you will be unsuccessful in everything you do. You may suffer oppression, be robbed, and alone. So I think that pretty much says it all. Everything keeps going wrong. This is the one that stood out to me and when I read it, and I read this as a curse, I was like, it, it just took my breath away. Because in 30, it says, you will marry a woman, but another will take her and rape her. I couldn't believe it when I read that. I was like, that's, it was like, what? Like that was allowed because a curse could come upon me. It was like, and, and my husband's family, they did all kinds of corrupt things. If a curse was even following his life, that could affect my life. And it was like, because his family, there was a lot of sexual abuse, a lot of rapes, and a lot of stabbings, and a lot of all kinds of corrupt things that you could think of. Like, I mean, there were people that, that were in the, um, what we call the Hui, the Hawaiian Mafia. <laughs> it was like really big in the crime world. It's like, so there was all kinds of corrupt stuff that happened on his side. And as we learn, even things that follow the husband can affect the wife and the children. But just imagine that, that's word for word, exactly what happened to me. 32, it says, your sons and daughters will be given to another nation. I think this will hit home for you guys. And you will wear out your eyes watching for them day after day. 
powerless to live ahead. Today I would relate that to CPS. But as I learned now, that also relates to you Native Americans. Your children were taken from you, forced into these um, boarding schools until they were 18 years old. Can you imagine? Oh, you can. You probably can. The parents watching their children being stripped away from them, powerless to lift their hands, looking for them with longing and weary eyes, but powerless to lift their hands against it. And if they tried, they were imprisoned or hurt. So there, that's a curse that follows the land. 33, a people that you do not know will eat what your land and labor produce, and you will have nothing but cruel oppression on your days. So, in other words, another nation will come and take over your land, which is what you saw and what we Hawaiians saw, right? The Hawaiians saw the same thing. And you will suffer for it. Does that sound like what happened to the Hawaiians? In verse 49, it talks about another nation is going to come and take over, and they speak another language. Basically, they're going to force their language on you. I mean, I hope that this is just making sense, like, and maybe we can do something about this. In 35, it says painful boils all over your body. So in other words, constant physical pain. 43, the foreigners who will reside among you will rise above you higher and higher, but you will sink lower and lower. I don't know what it is for you here, but I did talk about how it is for the Hawaiians. Hawaiians are number one for being the lowest educated in Hawaii. They are number one to be most likely to be arrested or incarcerated, put in jail. They are number one, for some reason, they are most likely to die earlier than other nationalities, the Hawaiian people. And number one, most likely to live in poverty or be homeless. I was curious if that was the same thing for you guys. I wasn't sure, but that is what it is for us. So here it is, the foreigners who took over our land, they come higher and higher, and the people who are, are the natives to the land became the lowest of the land. And they pushed them into the part of the land, the driest part of the land that nobody else wanted. <laughs> See, Waianae, like I said, has the highest population of Hawaiian people. The native people of the island, they're all pushed into our little city. We have the highest population of Hawaiian people in the whole world, in this one city. And uh, it's the land, like I said, it's the driest part of the, land, uh, of the island. 44. They will lend to you, but you will not lend to them. They will be the head, and you will be the tail. So in other words, you're always going to struggle with debt. 45. All these curses can come upon you. They will pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed. Because, again, because you did not obey the Lord your God and observe the commands and decrees he gave you. They will be a sign and a wonder to you and your descendants forever. Here's one that you might want to listen to, 54. It says, the sensitive and very refined man, meaning the gentleman, among you will be hostile toward his brother, toward his wife of his bosom, and toward the rest of his children whom he leaves behind. 56, the tender and the delicate woman among you who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground because of her delicateness and sensitivity, so she's a sweet little thing, will refuse, she will, I'm oh, sorry, will refuse to the husband of her bosom and to her son and her daughter. So basically, this is what it's saying. A gentleman, somebody who is a good man, has turned violent toward his own family and he leaves them. So a woman who is gentle and kind begins to turn away from her husband and her children too. Family has become meaningless or dead to them. All that matters now is surviving. Can you see that? Have you seen that in your land? I know I've seen it in mine. 58 through 59. If you do not carefully follow all the words of this law, which are written in this book, and do not revere this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God. See, revering the second commandment, putting God above all things. That's really the, the truth of it. This is where we need to get to be. These fearful plagues can come upon you and your descendants. See, and your descendants, not just you, and your descendants. Harsh and prolonged disasters and severe and lingering illnesses. 61, every kind of sickness and disaster, earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis, 
etc. 64. The people will be scattered in many different nations, forced out of your own land. Have you seen that? I know for us, Las Vegas is called one of the other islands of Hawaii because everybody has to leave Hawaii. The native people have to leave Hawaii because they can't afford to live in their own land. So a lot of them, we have a lot of family members that flew to Las Vegas because it's easier to survive there, forced out of their own land. They can't even survive in their own land because of the way it was, was the things that have been done to it. 65, anxious minds. So you're gonna see anxiety. Eyes that are weary with longing. You're going to see broken hearts. And the despairing heart, which is depression. 66 and 67 says, constant fear day and night, never sure of your life. So constant worry and scared of everything. Okay, so those are the curses. Have you seen any of those in your life? Have you seen any of those in your family? Have you seen them repeat in your family? I've seen so much of that repeat in my family. It's just like when I read these, it's like, whoa. How did we not see all of this? Here's the good news. This is good news. Jesus took all of our sins upon himself. In Isaiah 53, 5, let me see what page is this for you. This is page five for you. Isaiah 53, 5, in the Message Bible, it says, but it was our sins that did that to him that ripped and tore and crushed him. It was our sins. He took the punishment, and that made us whole. I like that word, and that's the reason why I use this verse, because that made us whole. It could say saved, but really the word is really talking about making you whole. When he took a punishment of our sins, right, when we talk about that judge, that just judge, he has to, there has to be payment. Well, when we're in the courtroom and we're standing before the judge, he says, did you commit this crime? We'd have to say yes. Because if we said no, we're lying, which means we committed another crime. <laughs> so we'd have to say yes, right? There is no way out other than one way, that there be a, someone who paid that penalty. And Jesus walks up and he says, Father, I paid it. I paid it in full with my blood. I paid. And the judge says, that's all I needed to hear was that it was paid for. You know, release. So he became sin for us and took the punishment for our sins, but we still need to repent for this to take place, right? He became sin for us. He became sin for us, but you sin. And the only way you can get clear is if you ask God to forgive you. You have to actually repent. It just doesn't automatically happen, <laughs> in other words. For 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For God, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, I have had Christians, and I don't preach this message a lot, but... I've decided that I'm going to just buckle loose and start talking more about it. I talk a lot to people, and I've done it with a lot of people, but churches are a little bit more sensitive. Some people will tell me, says, there's no such thing as a curse. There's no such thing as generational curses, and this is the scripture they use. Galatians 3.13. This is the New King James Version. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So since Jesus became a curse for us, there is no such thing as a generational curse. No curse can follow me. I accepted Christ into my life. Right? Okay, so we just read before this. He became sin for you. And he became a curse for you. But if you sin today, are you responsible for your sin? Even though he became sin for you, you're responsible for your sin? <laughs> and what do you have to do to be cleared of your sin? Repent. Just ask God. It's a simple prayer. God, forgive me for what I did. Right? And we turn away from it. What do we have to do to be clear of a curse? He became a curse for us to break every generation of curse and any curse that could possibly come upon us. What do we have to do to get cleared from a curse? All we have to do is say, God, forgive the sins 
of the generations before me. It's a simple prayer. It's a simple prayer, yet we never knew it, right? Or I didn't know it. Other people have, maybe. <laughs> so these bottom scriptures, um, you can read the red um, later, but it's basically what I just said. It says in Leviticus 26, 40, 42, it says, But if they will confess their sin and the sins of their ancestors, I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and I will remember the land. And in Psalm 79, 8, it says, it's like the people, the Israelites, are saying, God, do not remember the iniquities of our forefathers against us. So they understood that when they said, you know, God, forgive that, they were saying, God, please don't hold that against us. Okay, so what does God tell the Israelites to do? I'm going to read that scripture again in the fullness of it. Leviticus 26, 40 through 42. He says to them, he says, but if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me and that they have also walked, have walked contrary to me and that I have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. So now they're put into captivity, right? If their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they will accept their guilt, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham and I will remember I will remember the land that's so cool <laughs> if they'll ask me to forgive their sins and the sins of their fathers so what did the Israelites oh I should say do not did what did what the Israelites did or oh, what the Israelites did now that makes sense <laughs> In Daniel 9.16, these are just examples where they said, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, they were basically saying, you know, God, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people are reproached to all those around us. In Jeremiah 14.20, we see them saying, we acknowledge, O Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers. For we have sinned against you. Not I have sinned. We have sinned against you. In Nehemiah 9.2 it says, Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all the foreigners, and they stood and they confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. So you see them doing it. And this is just a few of them. You can actually look it up. There's more. <laughs> they did this often. So how? This is the question we have, right? How? How to get rid of the generational curses. I do these on the first page. This is really, um, you can go back to the first page, I think, and we'll go over this. The first thing that we do when I do this with people, the first thing we have to do is, number one, we've got to forgive. You know why? Because if you don't forgive, you can't be forgiven. So the, in, and, the, and the next step, if it says, you need to say, God, forgive my sins and the sins of the fathers. Well, you can't even be forgiven of your sins if you don't forgive. So we have to start with forgiving. You can't be like, I'll just forgive some people. I'll just forgive some things. Some of the things that we need to forgive are our government <laughs> for the things that they did to the reasons why there's so much um, problems going on in our lives. We need to forgive our spouses. We need to forgive our parents. And uh, we need to be very thorough about that. So here's a prayer that I usually lead people through. I'll go like this. I'll say, Father God. And they start with, I choose to forgive. I hear a lot of people go, it's like, I pray for my father who did this, 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 this. I was like, no, I'm not going sing. Like, I don't know, but I'm going to just, like, ask you to say the exact words. Instead of praying for him, I'm going to say, would you forgive him? I forgive him. Say the words, I forgive. Don't say I pray. <laughs> so this is the reason why I do it with people, because a lot of times I've heard some really funny things. But um, I ask them, you know, just would you say the words, I forgive. I choose to forgive. And if you're having a hard time, if there's somebody that has hurt you, like I have been hurt so bad, and when I tried to say I forgive, couldn't get the words out of my mouth. <laughs> it's like my jaw locked up and I couldn't say it. And whenever it gets like that, where it's just so you're so hurt or you're so angry that you can't even say it, my first prayer changes to, God, help me to be able to forgive. Because I might not be able to do it in myself, but right now I need to live through you because I know you have it in me to do it. 
And usually within a second or two, I am then able to say, God, I choose to forgive this person who hurt me. And um, when we do this, I don't just say, God, I choose to forgive my father for everything that he ever did. I usually am very, very specific, and I'll explain to you why. Because say, just say that you had a, a rough father who, when you were little, he just slapped you up against the wall, and you went flying up against the wall. That is a dagger all by itself. Then he got older, and he were like five, and he says, you're worthless. And it's almost like a slap again, but it's like another dagger inside of you. And then, you know, maybe you're about 10, and he starts to sexually abuse you. That's another dagger all by itself. And maybe he beats your mom in, um, in front of you. That's another knife in, inside of you, all from the same person. Different, not one dagger, right? You were hurt many times, multiple times. And so it's like, when we try to say, God, forgive, I forgive my father for everything he ever did, I found that that started the process, like God started to bring up those memories, but it didn't just take it all away. Yeah? Because there's individual memories, and each of them have their own daggers. And so here I had to learn to say, God, I choose to forgive. We'll, we'll, we'll just pretend like that example. God, I choose to forgive my father for beating me and for flying me from wall to wall or for hitting me and calling me all these names. God, would you take it? God, I choose to forgive him for the times he sexually assaulted me or, or molested me. And God, I choose to forgive him for the um, for for beating my mom. And I, I'm not saying my dad did that to me. I'm not. That's not what happened. <laughs> but I am just using that as an illustration. Other men did. My dad was not one of them. Um, but there were things I did need to forgive my parents for. There were things I did need to forgive my dad. My dad was a samurai. <laughs> but those were not the things. I don't want to get the wrong impression. But um, anyway, taking each dagger, I remember there was a memory I had to forgive where my dad only said it once. And I, he had asked me, he said, I want you to put, crush these leaves and put it over my garden that I just planted. He said, because it's a very windy day. And so as a child, I crushed these plumeria leaves. I crushed it real fine and thought, man, it took me hours because I made them so small. And I covered the garden, heaping over the garden to keep his seed leaves warm. And um, I thought, my dad's going to be so proud of me. And then what I didn't think about was it's a windy day. <laughs> so when my dad came home, the leaves had all blown away. <laughs> so he thought I didn't do it. And so he came in and he said, that girl, Abby, she can never do anything right, you know. <laughs> and I didn't have a dad who spoke much. So hearing those words, that pierced me. And I cried and I cried. And for many years, even after I had children, I always felt, no matter that I was a straight A student, no matter that I had all these accomplishments, I never felt like I could ever do anything right. Those words stuck inside of me. And so when God brought that memory back, just that one memory, I was raging. I hated him. I was like, he always saw me as this. You know, he always, you know, and brought up all these other things, but just that one memory was enough. And then there were other different things that happened. And uh, I know my dad did the best he could. I'm not angry with him now. I love my dad. He's a good, he's a good guy. <laughs> but he had a samurai for a father. And it was worse off for him. <laughs> so he didn't know how to be a dad. You know, it's like he didn't know how to speak to his, his children. Um, and so there were things that happened, you know, right? And my mom did things. And as a mom now, I totally get it. We do wrong things as parents. I'm not holding that against my parents anymore. But when God is bringing up those memories, you may feel absolute hatred towards them. Especially if they went and fooled around and left the family for someone else. They abandoned you. They rejected you. They said you weren't worth it. They sent a lot of messages in that one moment, right? They have their daggers. And each of those, we need to say, God, I choose to forgive them. This is how they made me feel. I was angry with them. I hated them for them for, for this, God. I hated that this guy who totally like wrecked my life, who thought that he could just take whatever he wanted, and all these men who touched me in the wrong way, that they could just turn me into a Barbie doll, like I'm not even a human. 
I hate them. And I was like, but God, I ask that you take this hatred. I ask that you take this pain. And I'm going to let go of this person and everything they did. Would you take it? And you let go of that knife. And you watch God take it. Because he's big enough, he's strong enough. And then I look down and I see this big wound in my chest that I just pulled the knife out of and it's gushing out blood. And I said, God, would you heal my heart? And I watched God, and this is literally how I saw it. His finger came down, and he went, Sss. And when he lifted his finger, there wasn't even a scar. That was cool. And I've learned to do this. My husband has a horrendous story, but we have learned to do this one by one. Don't rush it. Be thorough. This is the first step. We need to forgive. Lord, I choose to hand this person and this hurt over to you. And I ask you to take all the pain, the heartbreak, and the anger away. Heal my heart and make it whole. In Jesus' name. Okay. Right here, right? We give it to God. Oh, if we could all have bodies that look like that, yeah? <laughs> Wounded to just perfect. <laughs> Number two. After we forgive, now we can repent. Now we can be forgiven. So now we repent and we ask God to forgive the sins that we have committed. And this is the prayer that I wrote. Now it does not have to be this exact prayer. Like don't get into it like it has to be like this. But let me just say these are points that go along with scripture. God, please forgive the sins that I have committed against you. Forgive me for. God, forgive me for. And some of you are going to say, God, forgive me for the times I sexually abuse someone. God, forgive me for the times I physically abuse someone. God, forgive me for the time I committed an affair or um, had sex before marriage or lied or stole or disobeyed you, God, or put other things before you, God. There's going to be many things that God is going to reveal if you'll give him permission. Don't hide from God. He'll forgive you of everything. But, like that sign, you see that repent? Turn around. You don't just say sorry and keep going in the same direction. We've got to go in the direction that he says to go. So I'm sorry that I disobeyed you, God. Help me to walk in holiness and obedience to you. That would be something like a prayer that you could say. It doesn't have to be exactly. Number three. This is the third step I do with people in Hawaii when we do this generation curse breaking thing. Now, now we can ask God to forgive the sins of the generations because it says God forgive our sins and the sins of our generations. You can't not have one without the other. You can't ask God to forgive the sins of your generations if you're not willing to confront your own because they go hand in hand. Every time in scripture you'll see it hand in hand or together. Pray of repentance of your ancestors, Father God. Forgive the sins that my father, my mother, my grandparents, or you could just say generations before me, whatever, all my family members have committed before me. Forgive them for, and you guys heard me, how I did it. God, I ask you to remove the punishment of their sins from being over my life. Help me to never walk in the way that I repeat the sins that they have committed. That's basically what I'm saying. One thing that we need to be very clear is um, that the person, like when you say, God forgive my generations before me for the sexual abuse or for the incest or for having sex outside of marriage or for worshiping other gods, your grandma, your mom, your dad, whoever maybe passed before you, uh, it could be generations, right? Um, they're not forgiven of their sins. They're held responsible before God for their sins. What you are asking God is that he no longer holds you responsible for their sins. Because I mean, there's some people that teach you that you can ask God to forgive the sins of your ancestors and that they're forgiven and washed clean and they stand before God not guilty anymore. And that's not true. They all stand before God. We all have to repent for ourselves. But we are asking God that the consequence of their sins, because again, it keep, he never clears the guilty. God, don't hold us responsible. Please forgive the sins that were committed. I stand in, the, I stand in that gap asking you to forgive the sins my generations have committed before me. Don't let any curse fall on my life because of those sins anymore. So that's number three. Number four is we start to break 
spoken curses. This is the very last step I do. So there's these four steps, right? Forgiving, repenting, asking God to forgive the sins of our generations, and then we go through breaking spoken curses. Let me give you some scriptures. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Proverbs 18.23. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in, the, in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth came praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. So out of our mouths, we can say blessings, we can say curses. The one who guards his mouth protects his life. Wow, your words can protect your life. The one who opens his lips invites his own ruin. Our words can cause ruin in our life. Or it can protect our life. Matthew 12, 36 to 37. This is not in the handout, so you might, you know, if you need those, those scriptures, you can either watch the video again or, or write them down. Matthew 12, 36 to 37. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, meaning released, called as innocent, you let go. Or by your words, you will be condemned. Luke 6, 45. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth is going to speak. So we want to check our hearts because we want to watch our words. Woo. Harsh words, they do hurt. You see that fist coming out of the guy's mouth? Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification of building up? What is good for building each other up? That it might impart grace to the hearers. So here's some scriptures. Just want you to understand the power of your words. There's power of life and there's power of death. It can protect your life or could cause ruin in your life or even in others because it, right? It affects others like that girl getting punched in the face. I'm going to read this, uh, this thing that I wrote, I'm not that I wrote, that I read. It says, the spirituality, nuclear, eternal power of prayer. It's a nuclear power of prayer. The devil has no ability to contain prayer. He can't stop it. Prayer is spiritually nuclear in nature. It is the raw material of God and his people. Prayer is out of Satan's influence. Short, in short, he can't stop it. Once prayer is released, there is nothing he can do to stop it. He has no power to warp or influence a prayer's path to God's throne after it has been prayed. Once it's been prayed, he can't stop it. Once a prayer is unleashed, it bounces around eternity in perpetuity, perpetuity, burning before the throne of God like incense. It says the prayer of the saints are collected in bowls, right, of incense that are later brought to the throne of God. So, it's forever. Once it's released, it is eternal. It cannot be stopped. This is why prayer is so spiritually dangerous for Satan. It supersedes the limitations of a mortal world. Prayer is immortal. It has no boundaries and no marker lines. Prayer holds ultimate potential. The best the devil can hope for is that you don't pray. And much of his strategy is to discourage you from praying at all. As a prayer never prayed has zero chance of ever being answered. So if you never pray, you have zero chances of it ever being answered. What is prayer? Prayer is you doing what? Right, talking to God, right? So when we speak things out, we're, we're just talking, right? We're talking, and your tongue is the power of life and death. And it says, when you pray the will of God, he begins to fulfill it. Well, what happens when you begin to speak these things out that are not the will of God? It says it has the power to bring ruin into your life. It has the power to bring death in your life. Who do you think is fulfilling that? I mean, just think about it. You don't have to say it, but understand your words have eternal power. They have weight. The minute you release them out, unless you ask God to break it, <laughs> or asked to retract it, it's forever going out. So be careful what we say over our spouses, what over our family, over ourselves. So this is why we break spoken curses. 
It's important that we do this. And this is one of the prayers that we pray. And like I said, it's not exact, but I want you to get an idea. It says, Lord, I ask you to break every generational curse that has come upon my life because of either my sin or the sins committed by my family members before me. And God, I ask that you break any curses that I have spoken, that have been spoken by others over my life or any of my family members before me. Lastly, please break any curses or negative words that I spoke over my own self. Wash me clean, Lord, and set me completely free. Make me holy and use me for your glory. Holy Spirit, fill every area of my life. Lord, you take every empty place and fill it to the overflow, that I might live the way you desire. See, I'm speaking things out. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness and help me to be your witness in this world. Help me to know you more in Jesus' name. Here's another one I read. This wasn't from me, but it says, I repent for all ancestors who were evil and tried to control and frustrate the poor. Lord, I repent for any in my family line who put up security or pledges for another. Lord, please forgive any, any unfulfilled debts. I break all ungodly covenants, oaths, and alliances. Lord, please remove all traps or snares from the, from the words of my own mouth. Please break all sluggish and slumbering spirits from me and restore wisdom and ambition. Again, we're looking at that Psalm 79, 8, where they're saying, God, just remember the iniquity. I do not remember the iniquities of our forefathers against us. Don't hold it against us, God. So when we just, so one of the basic things is that God, break any curse that I ever spoke over myself. God, break any curse that anyone ever spoke over me in this whole world. And God, break any curse that anyone ever spoke over my generations before me. Now, you guys might understand this better. Some people don't. But um, we, have, we have witch doctors, right, that people pay to put curses, not just on you, but on your whole family. And satanic rituals, they even do this. I don't know if that happened with the Kachinas and things like that, if they, if they did such things like that. Where it's like, but there are times that even people, just random people will say, this family, this family is worthless. This family will never amount to anything. This family is always going to be sick. They're always going to be perverts. They're always going to be poor. They're never, ever going to be anything. See, those words, if they have the power of life and death in their tongue, they're speaking that over you and you don't even know. It is important that we start to say, God, break any curse that anyone has ever spoken over me or any of my generations. They might have said it over your grandpa and said it. His, all their generations are going to be this way. Let's not let that follow us. Let's make sure we cover it all. We might as well, right? It's as simple as a prayer. <laughs> We're not having to work hard. We're just saying these prayers that are, are definitely backed up in Scripture. And it's amazing what God does with it. I mean, I'm, I'm so serious. And you could see the results. How to remain free from any curse. Now, once we broke that, usually by that last one, and oh my gosh, I've done this with so many people, but when we have done that last thing where we say, God, break every curse, right at the end, it's like, whoa, God just comes. Oh. I did this with someone uh, in Hopi Land, and we wound up on the floor. <laughs> he came like a bomb. <laughs> it was just like, whoa, and we, we couldn't get up. <laughs> and we could not get up. It, it's, uh, some people just... Uh, you can ask some of the teens even, you know, like we've done this with the really rebellious teens and they look like fish out of water and when God's presence hits them, it's like, whoa, and they do not wake up the same. I've had one person I did this with and the minute that we did that last prayer, she went, Phew! she was out. <laughs> I said, when she gets up, she will not be the same person. And sure enough, when she got up, she looked at the world and just like, oh, I've never seen it like this. She said it just like her. She's like, I can't believe she's like, this is what God's been talking about. And she was a homeless lady that, you know, it's like, it was just amazing watching God just get a hold of her right then. I mean, when everything is cleared, right? When everything is empty. And then we say, Holy Spirit, every place that just had to be emptied, everything that just had to leave, fill it. <laughs> fill it with your love. Fill it with your joy. Fill it with your peace. Fill it with you, God, because we want just you. We don't want anything else. And as long as we remain, right, we shouldn't ever have anything come back on us. How do we remain free from any curse? We've got to know this. 
Because I promise, if you go back walking into sin and things like that, sin allows things to happen, right? There's a payment that needs to be made. But again, if you ever do, just repent. <coughs> How do we remain? Live holy. Live holy. That's what the Bible keeps talking to us about. Live holy. Obey God. How are you going to build your house upon the rock? you got to hear God, and you have to obey Him. You can't do your own thing. Don't make God your Savior, right? Don't just make God your Savior where it's like, God, I need this. I'm, I'm in big trouble. I didn't study for my test, but I'm about to fail because i got to go take this test. So God, would you da -da -da -da, come to my rescue and help me cheat on my test? <laughs> Or God, you know, I spent all my money on silly things, but um, now I need money to pay for this thing. You know, it's like, would you please come, da -da -da -da, come to the rescue? <laughs> We're constantly asking God to be Savior, right? And it's not bad. God wants to be Savior. He is Savior, okay? But he's also Lord. You're supposed to accept him as Savior and Lord. And Lord means he's in charge. Live holy. Ask him what he wants in your life. Read the word. Live it. Whoever hears these sayings of mine, read it, hear it, and does them. It's him who builds his house upon the rock. And when the storms come, he will still be sustained. He will not fall. But he who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, I will liken him to the man who built his house upon the sand. And when the storm comes, great shall be his fall. Right? We don't want to be that. So let's live holy. Psalms 101, 3-4 says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I will hate the works of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Let's look at that scripture very carefully. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I have a rule in my house that everything we watch cannot disagree with the word of God. That's just my standard. Because I, I want things that are in my home to be holy, reflect holiness. I want the things that are in my home that we listen to, I want that to reflect holiness. I want the words that come out of our mouth to reflect holiness. I want the things that we participate in to reflect holiness. In other words, if the TV show that we're watching, um, say the guy, you know, they show that people had um, sex outside of marriage or had an affair, and then the person repents, and at the end of the movie, the message is that they learned from that mistake and that they repented and they got their life right, then that's okay, because that is reality. People are gonna make mistakes, but it agrees with the word of God. It's not saying it's okay to do those things. But there are other shows that you watch, like CSI, that they're like, everybody's sleeping with everybody. <laughs> Soap poppers, everybody's sleeping with everybody, <laughs> right? And they never say it's wrong. They never teach that homosexuality is wrong. They never teach that having sex outside of marriage is wrong. They never teach that even stealing as long as it's for a good reason is wrong. You know, it's like, and though in that case, I don't want that in my kids' heads because I know that will cause failure in their life if they think that's okay. And so we don't allow those things in our home. We do not watch those shows. So that makes it very difficult to find things that you can watch, right? But I will set nothing wor worthless before my eyes. It's worthless. I will hate the works of those who fall away. So those who fall away are those who are sinning. Meaning, I don't want to have that, and I don't like it. And if I don't like it, I'm not going to watch it. If I'm not okay with my kids doing it, I'm not going to watch it. I'm not going to set it before my eyes. And it says, and it shall not cling to me. So let's reverse that scripture. I will set everything worthless before my eyes. I'll watch pornography, I'll watch whatever on TV that I feel like watching, I'll do whatever I want to do with my eyes. And I, I take in pleasure in the things that people do that have sinned and fallen away from you, God. I'm choosing to take pleasure in it. I'll watch the things that, uh, with divination and magic and things like that, you know, I'll watch it, whatever. And it shall cling to me. So if you reverse it, you see what happens if you do it. Things will cling to you. What's clinging to you? Maybe you might want to ask <laughs> yourself. Here's a, here's a thing. It says, be careful what you watch. Satan uses visual images to build a stronghold in your mind. So when it's time to pray, all you see is his images instead of the plans of God. One of Satan's greatest military strategies is to cloud your spirit. And I will tell you this is the truth. This is the reason. This is really the reason. 
why I do not watch those kinds of things. Because when I, when I pray for people, or sometimes when I meet them, and I shake their hands or something, and I look them in the eye, sometimes God shows me things in their life, things I wouldn't tell myself. I, I, I've seen things like, um, like a person getting physically abused, or somebody who's you know doing things that they shouldn't be doing, or, um, or somebody who was sexually abused when they were like five years old. All of a sudden, I see this. I see what's happening. And when I start watching regular things on TV, this is a crazy thing. I, I stop seeing. I can't see anything. And <laughs> when I was going through my dark season, I was being rebellious. And my rebellion was, I'll just watch whatever's on TV. <laughs> I didn't care. I was angry with God. I just watch whatever. Just get my mind off of whatever's happening in my life. I just watched whatever. And um, for a good solid year. See, the teenagers can tell you that a lot of people in, in um, our, our youth group and in our, they, they are scared to be around me sometimes because God shows things. <laughs> he shows things like, um, things like they're about to like, have sex before marriage and God will show me the things that they're doing in secret like, and, um, or that they're living a homosexual lifestyle and God will show me and I will pray with them and I will talk to them. I'm not condemning. God never does anything to show something to, to hurt somebody. He was trying to help them. And thank God he did in this particular situation. Because he did. He saved them from something majorly dangerous for them. But most of the time, I just pray for them. And I love them. I don't care what you're doing. All I care about is that you get your life right with God because I don't want hell for you. Okay, so the kids sometimes get a little nervous around me. But for that whole year that I was in a dark pit, almost a year and a half, I come across people, I saw nothing, nothing in their life. I actually kind of felt good that I didn't see anything for a while, but I couldn't see anything that God had to show me either. <laughs> I couldn't see anything. And so I like to be able to see what God is doing. I like to be able to hear God. So I want to protect my ears. I don't want to cloud it with wrong things. I want my ears to stay holy so I can hear the things that he has to say. I want my eyes to stay holy because I want to see what he's doing and where he's at. And want I want to see through his eyes. And then I want my mouth to be holy. And I want my hands to be holy. You know, you see what I'm saying? I don't want to participate in the things that the Bible says not to participate in. I want to live holy. Now, it is not that easy, but, you know, we can always strive to say, God, teach me how. This is what we need to live like. We need to live a life of repentance and walk in humility before the Lord. And no curses can come upon you. Proverbs 26, 2, a curse cannot come without, or a curse without a cause shall not alight. In the NLT it says, an undeserved curse cannot land on his intended victim. So demonic things want to mess with your life. They cannot touch you if they don't have a cause. If you commit a crime, again, the police, if they catch you, they are allowed to arrest you. They are allowed to press charges against you, right? That's legal right. They have legal right to do this. Again, if you speed and a police officer isn't around, you might get away with it from a physical police officer. But if you sin, you never escape the spiritual police. You cannot. Every sin is accounted for. So you are going to be held responsible. They are very legalistic. Demonic things are very legalistic. If you give them the right, they are allowed to mess with your life. If they have the right, what gives them the right? Your sins. Holding on to unforgiveness gives them a right to mess with you. Use your, your own sins that you commit, they, that gives them legal right to mess with you. And now we understand that even generational things gives them legal right to mess with you and the words that are spoken, only if you haven't dealt with those other things can mess with you. But, again, if it's paid for, if the curse has been broken, if you have asked God to forgive you, then that judge will take that gavel and say, innocent, you cannot, you cannot, and you have no legal right, you must release them, right? So every demonic thing has to leave you alone, and you are set free. Okay? On that paper, one of the last pages, let's see what page, seven, 
This is what I call the wall of sin. When I do this with people, this is what we do. We start out with this paper, and I have them take a look at it. And one of the things I ask them to do, I say, I want you to take your pen or your pencil. I want you to look at this wall of sin so that it re-triggers your mind of things maybe you've done that you're not even realizing maybe, but you need to, to really like ask God about it or that God will re-trigger it in your mind. But it's just giving you some things to think on. And I ask them to circle any of the sins that you're committing. So they circle it. Okay? And so these are the sins that we're going to ask God to forgive us for. Are the ones that you that you circled. If there are other things that are not on this list, I ask them to write it down on the corners all around the paper. Write down the things you know you need to ask God to forgive you for if they're not in that list. Second, we're going to use the same list and we're going to ask God to forgive the generational sins before us. Because really, if you look at almost every single one of those things in there, chances are somebody in your generations have committed it. <laughs> Pretty much. Now, the Bible doesn't make you have to list it one by one, but we do it one by one only because I want you to take a stand. And as you say it, God forgive the sins of my generations for committing suicide. You're saying, God, I understand that's a sin. I'm saying I will not participate in that. God, I ask that you forgive them for incest. You're saying, I'm not going to participate in that. You're understanding that's a sin and you're, it's an abomination against God. And you're saying, I will not do this. So this is the wall of sin that we use to ask God to forgive us of our sins. We use this as, the, as a, just something to help us to think about the sins of our generations. And again, if you think of anything else in your generations that are not on this list, you write it down. And then last of all, on that very last page, you will see that the list of people or the memories that you need to forgive. And again, I want you to be thorough. So I don't normally do this with people until they have done that part of the, those last two pages. If they do those last two pages and they come to me and they say, hey, will you do this with me? That's where I usually do it with the people. Because I want them to have thought about it. I want them to really like, like make sure that they let God speak to their heart so they can be thorough, because we want to get to everything. <laughs> and, um, and then after that, we just simply pray. We just simply pray together and do those four steps. And it all gets crushed, every sin and everything thrown away. And this is where we experience God's freedom. And uh, if ever, like I said, if ever you start to see that you made some mistakes and you start to feel any kind of um, heaviness starting to come back on you, you do all four again. God, have, do I have unforgiveness in my life? God, is there anything I need to ask you to forgive me for? And God, if I have any generations of still alive, forgive any sins that they're committing. You don't even have to say one by one at that time. Just say that. And then God, break any curse I ever spoke over myself. God, break any curse anyone ever spoke over me. God, break any curse that anyone spoke over my generations. I call them a re-up. We do it. We just say those prayers. And um, usually that, that heaviness will disappear right like that. And so we've been living this, um, a good number of us right here. I've been living this, and this is where you're seeing transform lives. Um, we're, we've done this with people who rape people. We have done this with very violent, abusive people. We have done this with pretty much anybody you can think of <laughs> that have done all kinds of crazy acts. And um, I have not yet seen God disappoint. We have seen God show up every single time. So take it to prayer. I'm showing it to you. I'm, I'm talking to you about it. You're hearing it. Think about what you've been seeing in your generations. Think about what could follow your children or why those things were happening. You wondered why. Why you kept doing these things that you hated. You wondered why. What was controlling you? Why you couldn't break away from certain things. You wondered why your parents did certain things. Why your children are doing certain things. And you don't understand it. I hope that this makes it so much clearer for you. And uh, let's take this to prayer. And again, like I'll be here until July 5th. Um, you could do this on your own. I'm not saying you have to do it with me. you got the paper that shows you how to do it. But I have found that it is beneficial to do it with someone else. Um, but uh, you can take my number tonight. You can meet up with me sometime in the week before I leave. I am. That's what I'm here for. This is what I'm here for, is to walk as many of you through this as possible. 
I truly believe if the Hawaiian people would come together like the Israelites did, the Israelites would be put into captivity in most unusual ways. They would come together finally, stop being so stubborn and stop being so hard-headed. And they would say, God, forgive our sins and the sins of our fathers. And then all of a sudden, the Red Seas would part, or kings would release them in supernatural ways. All of a sudden, they're set free again, restored back to their land. Then they get crazy again, and they start doing human sacrifices to other gods. And again, weird things happen. They get put back into captivity. Again, they say, God, forgive our sins and the sins of our fathers. Again, they're supernaturally released. <laughs> I truly believe in the Hawaiian people, if we would come together as a nation, and we would do this, God, forgive our sins and the sins of our fathers. I, I have a theory. Don't hold me to this, but I have a theory. This is something that I found interesting. Every nation that did human sacrifices to another god as a nation, as their, in, in their practices, they became the lesser of nations. And the Hawaiians did human sacrifices to other gods. A lot of the Polynesian cultures, uh, culture, um, they did human sacrifices to other gods. And um, all those nations that I know of that did human sacrifices to other gods became the lesser of nations. When I looked at all the nations that were put on top, that are the greatest of nations, as a nation, they never did human sacrifices to other gods. Europe, America, you know, all of Russia, Germany. I never saw them do human sacrifices to other gods. Um, they did every other abominable sin. <laughs> They murdered, they raped, they did extortion, they took over, they were greedy, they were selfish, they lied, they did everything else. But that second commandment where it talks about, you know, can you imagine how God would have felt? He created you, fearfully, wonderfully made, you're his beloved. And then we take his people that he loves that much, and we sacrifice them to another God. Something happens in this world when we begin to do that. And there are some things we need to ask God to forgive our generations for. I truly believe that if we will come together as a people and a nation and begin to say, God, we realize now that this has a lot of curse on our land and over our people. And we say, God, forgive it. We will see things break over our lives. We will see things break over our nations. And I truly believe that we may actually see Hawaii restored back to the people um, if, if they would do this in supernatural ways. But it's going to take us repenting before one God. Yeah. So let, let me pray. And uh, again, catch me. Stop me. Find me if you want to do this with me. I want to do this with you. Okay. Father God, I ask that you would take this. I know it's so much information. But if they have to watch the video over and over again to get it, help them to dive deep into your word, to read the scriptures for themselves, and that you would let them know what you have to say on this subject. Show them, show each of us the things that we have not forgiven. Bring it to the forefront of our mind. Bring it to the front of our mind so we can think about it and see it. Even if it's been pressed down and we've forgotten, bring it up so that we can forgive it and get rid of it. God, if there are sins that we've committed and even the ones that we don't even realize, teach us, show us. Help us to see it clearly. Things that you don't want us to be watching. Things that you don't want us to be listening to. Conversations that we shouldn't be having. And things that we shouldn't be touching and doing. God, confront our hearts. Bring every sin out of our lives. So we can live holy before you. And God, just teach us what to do. As far as the things that are in our generations that have been repeated. Show the truth of that. And God, I ask that you would just raise up this nation to say you are going to be our God and we are going to be your people. Heal this land, God, as we come before you and we humble ourselves and pray and we repent of our sins and our wicked ways and even the wicked ways of our fathers. And God, I thank you that you're going to hear from heaven and heal our land and forgive our sins. God, I thank you that restoration is going to come to this place. There's no other reason that you sent us here than that you want to restore. You want to restore what has been taken, what Satan has done and meant for evil. I thank you, God, that you're going to turn these lives and we're going to see amazing, amazing miracles and transformations in your children's lives because you love us. 
So would you have your way and would your words penetrate in our hearts, sink deep into our spirits, and may we begin to apply it to our lives. And may this message not be forgotten. May it repeat until we allow you to have your way in us, God. In Jesus' name, amen.